Hello students, Dr. Dia here. I have received some questions from students about quiz number 11, the one about liquids and intermolecular forces. And so I just want to help you out, so I'm going to walk you through the answers to the questions in this quiz. And I think it will be good practice, especially in anticipation of our next step. So let's go ahead and do that. So let's take the first question here. True or false? One would expect water to have lower boiling point than C2A6 because water has stronger intermolecular forces. So the operating concept here is water has stronger intermolecular forces. So what we're saying is then that uh, because water has stronger intermolecular forces, the molecules of water are more closely packed with each other. And there's a statement we make here that, uh, you know, boiling point increases with increasing molecular force. Why is that? Well, remember that in order for a substance to boil, we have to break up these interactions that are between the molecules, right? And these are not bonds. These are just intermolecular attractions. And we have to be able to essentially move these molecules away from each other. And as you can see, if they are more closely packed, you're going to need more energy to move them apart from each other. And therefore, you're going to be able to accomplish that at a higher temperature. That's why the boiling point increases with increasing molecular force. And that's why then the answer here is false. Okay, let's take this next question now. True or false? Due to intermolecular forces, the molecules in a gas are packed more closely than the particles in a liquid. Again, this goes back to the kinetic molecular model that we discussed for gases, and then we amplify it in this unit for liquids and solids. So the idea is that the reason why a substance is predominantly in the gas state is because there are weak intermolecular forces. And therefore, the molecules are free to move about without any uh, kind of interruption or interaction with the other molecules. In a liquid, on the other hand, which you can see here on the right side, the molecules are more closely packed because they have stronger intermolecular forces. And yeah, they can kind of like slide past each other a little bit, and there's a little motion in there. They're not fixed like they are in a solid. But still, because they have stronger intermolecular forces, as we can see here, they have, uh, they are packed more closely due to these uh, molecular, intermolecular forces. And therefore, that is why the answer to this is false. All right, let's go to the next question. It shows us here the structure of palmitic acid, and you can see it here. And we have sort of highlighted two sections of the molecule. It is common for many compounds in nature to be made of, of larger molecules than the ones that we typically work with in Unit 10. And many times, the uh, molecule is organized in this way where you can identify kind of regions or sections of it. Uh, which of the following statements is correct? And it all has to do with whether section A and B are polar or nonpolar. So let's look at the structure here. And remember, what are the criteria for a substance to be polar or not? Number one, it has to have at least one polar covalent bond. So have at least one polar bond. Now, in this case, remember, we're considering both of these uh, sections of the molecule separately. Remember, the CC bond is nonpolar, and the CH bond, uh, if we apply electronegativity, negativity of uh, values, and so the difference between a carbon and a hydrogen uh, atom is roughly about 0.4, which is the limit of polarity. So we would say, therefore, that based on this, uh, section B 
doesn't have polar bonds. Therefore, it is not polar, just by this one criteria. Now, remember, if the region of the molecule or the molecule overall does have a polar bond, then we ask the question, is the molecule symmetric? In other words, if you were to take those polar bonds and add them up as vectors, do you generate a net vector? Right. So in this case, we would look at section A, and it does have a CO bond that is polar. And you can see that the central atom here of that section, the carbon, has an oxygen here and oxygen there, but it has a carbon on this side. So therefore, section A is not symmetric, not symmetric. Therefore, section A is polar, right? Because we said that, uh, I'm sorry, let me go back here to this one here uh, and say that section A has polar bonds. But remember, in order for it to be polar, it also has to be not symmetric. And I gave you a shortcut to this, I believe. I told you, look, just ask yourself the question uh, when this word symmetric or non-symmetric comes around. Is The question you ask is, ask, you know, uh, is everything connected to the central atom the same? Are they all, I'm sorry, are, all, are they all the same kinds of atoms or are there atoms and lone pairs or are there different kinds of atoms on that central one? So in the case here of part A, section A, carbon has oxygen here, oxygen there, carbon on this side. So in other words, it tells you that section A, besides the fact that it has polar bonds, it also has a non-symmetric character. So section A is polar. So let's find out what is the uh, what is the answer here that tells us that section A is non-polar. We said no. Both sections non-polar. No. Section B is polar. No. Section A is polar and section B is non-polar. That fits what we just discussed. Section A is non-polar. Section B is polar. It doesn't match. So that means that the correct answer is this one here. Section A is polar. Section B is non-polar. Okay, here is our next question. Cyanide and fluoride, FCN, has a molar mass of 45 grams per mole and a boiling point of about minus 46 degrees Celsius. Hydrogen cyanide, HCN, has a molar mass of about 27 grams per mole and a boiling point of about 26 degrees Celsius. Both molecules are linear with a central carbon. Why is the boiling point of HCN higher? And again, you don't really have to write out the formulas, but let's go ahead and do that just for the sake of illustration. So here would be HCN on the top, and here is FCN. And again, we're saying that HCN has 25 grams per mole, FCN 46 grams per mole. It says that both of them are linear, which we can confirm here by drawing the Lewis structures. You didn't really have to draw the Lewis structures. All you needed to know was that they're linear, and carbon is the central atom, right? So the issue now is the HCN has a higher boiling point, right? We said that higher uh, boiling point, and the uh, other molecule has a lower boiling point. Remember, boiling point has to do with the strength of intermolecular force. Higher boiling point, that means it has stronger intermolecular forces. Now let's ask ourselves, what could be the uh, causing factor in this? Notice, HCN is a smaller molecule. 
it has 25 grams per mole, whereas FCN has 46 grams per mole. So in other words, this guy is a bigger molecule, bigger molecule, so it, so it should have a stronger London dispersion forces. We said that the size of a molecule uh, is directly related to the London dispersion force. But if that if that all there is, then based on having stronger London dispersion forces, FCN should have the higher boiling point, and it doesn't. So that means there's something else at play. Well, we notice that both the uh, carbon-nitrogen bonds are polar. The question now is, is the carbon-hydrogen bond polar? The answer is no. Is the carbon-fluorine bond polar? The answer is yes. So we're going to say that you know, this bond here is polar. Let me get this out of the way here. Very good. And this one here is not a polar bond. So we're going to bring this over here, the little box over here. So that means that in the molecule of HCN, most of the electron density is drawn essentially towards the nitrogen. Whereas in the FCN, both of the nitrogen and the fluorine atoms are pulling away at electrons. And all that we can say is that it must be an issue of dipole dipole forces. Which one? has the stronger dipole-dipole force. Well, uh, it must be the one that has the higher boiling point. So if we go back to our um, question here, we would say that it has to be that there is stronger uh, forces in the HCN. Now it says here, HCN is a smaller molecule, therefore it has stronger lone dispersion forces. That is not correct. FCN is not polar. We saw that it is polar. HCN has a stronger dipole moment, and therefore it has stronger dipole-dipole forces. That sounds like a possible answer, so let's, let's consider that one here as one of our possible answers. Oops. I'm hoping I can get this guy to work here. Highlighter. No, I'm not getting it to work. Okay, well, uh, anyway, that would be the answer. The FC bond in FCN is more difficult to break. Remember, boiling point has nothing to do with covalent bonds. We don't break covalent bonds in causing a substance to go from liquid to gas. HCN is a larger molecule. No, we know that it already has 27 grams per mole versus 45. And I'm sorry, I think I may have written it wrong in the uh, other uh, sheet that I had in this. So essentially, we are saying that our answer has to be that the reason why we have this issue is because HCN must have a stronger dipole moment. Okay, let's look at this last question. The compound SeO2, which you would call, of course, selenium dioxide, would be expected to have the following types of intermolecular force. Okay, here's a strategy for all kinds of multiple choice questions. Start out by eliminating the ones that are definitely going to be wrong. For example, SeO2. There are no hydrogens in this compound. Therefore, any option that includes hydrogen bonding, we can rapidly eliminate. So hydrogen bonding, out. Dipole, dipole, and hydrogen bonding, that one's also out. Uh, London dispersion forces and hydrogen bonding, that one is out. So notice that we basically, like in all kinds of multiple choice questions, you can usually eliminate three out of five, and that leaves you with two of them. London dispersion and dipole-dipole, or London dispersion forces only. Now remember, every single compound should have, I'm sorry, every single compound should have London dispersion forces. So we're definitely going to leave those in there. So they're going to be in there always. The question now is, does this molecule have dipole-dipole forces? Well, here's what you do, and you don't have to do much in here. Let's go to our periodic table and find where they are. Here's O. Oops, 
sorry. So here's O, right? And here is selenium. You can see they're both in the same family. So they have the same valence. And the compound we're talking about, SeO2, should remind you of one that you did in your practices in Unit 10, the SO2, sulfur dioxide. But if you really want to, you know, be kind of like um, detailed about it, what we're going to do is let's go ahead and spend some time building this structure. Oops, I came out a little too big here. So here it is. That's what the structure would look like. And... You know, you had plenty of time in the quick. Most of the other questions you should have knocked off in about a minute, two minutes each, which gives you plenty of time to do this structure here. The question is, is it polar? Well, remember, as long as the compounds have different electron, I'm sorry, as long as the elements have different electronegativities, 3.5, 2.4, and that difference is greater than 0.4, that means the bonds are polar. The question is, are they distributed in a non-symmetric way? And we see that when we look at the selenium atom, uh, it has a lone pair, an oxygen, and an oxygen. In other words, it is not symmetric. That means that for all uh, practical purposes, this molecule should have dipole-dipole forces, and therefore, this should be the Correct. It's correct. Answer. All right. That should be your correct answer. It has both London dispersion because all of them have it and dipole dipole forces because once we drew the structure, we could see that it is not symmetric and therefore it was 